that was a good song. Aaron, oh my goodness, man. Anybody want to preach? Because I'm sort of a mess, so just kidding, just kidding. Father, as we um, come to your scriptures, Lord, as we come weak and frail, clay, earthen vessels, cracked and needing to be filled, Lord, we trust that you can do that. You've done it, and we want to ask you to do it again. So may your scriptures be food for our soul today. We pray it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Uh, William Camillo, in um, 1947, May 28th, got up, head popped off the pillow, and he went to school or went to work like he did every other day. He was a bus driver in New York City. But this day was a little bit different because William started out on his normal path and instead of making his first stop in New York City, he just kept driving. And he went to New Jersey and he had a sandwich at a cafe for lunch and then he just kept driving more and driving and driving. Eventually, he got to Washington, D.C. in his RTD bus. He got out of it, took a look at the White House, and decided, you know what? I'm just going to keep going. And he traveled down the uh, East Coast all the way from New York City to Hollywood, Florida, where eventually he ran out of money and gas. He decided to go for a night swim, and he camped that evening, and in the morning called his former employer and (laughs) told them where he was and what he needed. They sent the FBI to come and investigate. It was a state bus and um, none of them were able to drive the bus. So William had to drive the bus back to New York for them. And he did, drove it all the way back to New York. By the time he got there, word had spread about his little meltdown, and he was so popular that he was too popular to actually fire. And they had to keep him on staff. Google it, true story. (laughs) They asked him afterwards what had happened, and he said, quote, I just got tired of it all. He said, I felt like a squirrel in a cage, just running around and around and around, and I guess it finally got the better of me. I think he was greeted with such fanfare when he came back to New York because everybody has thought about doing the same thing, right? I mean, mean, haven't we? We've been on our way to work, or we've been on our way to an appointment, and, and we've thought, you know, heads California, tails Carolina, right? Like, To just say, like, let's just, it's just too much. And I think a lot of our lives, we we feel like, like we are. Like, we're full. And life's good. And sometimes because that's the case at points in our life, we expect that it will be the case at every point in our life. But we all know that that's not true, don't we? That there's things that we walk through that just start to sort of take the air out of us a little bit. There's some of you, in the last few weeks, you've gotten a diagnosis from the doctor that you weren't hoping to get, and and it's just taken the air out of you. So Some of you in this room, you're single parents, and you're working, and you're holding together a family, And it just feels like you're on life support. Like the waves are beating against your boat, and and when is it when is it gonna stop? Some of you, you have some things that have happened in your past. Maybe maybe it's some abuse or maybe it's bad decisions you've made. And anytime you let your mind relax, instead of disciplining yourself not to think about that, that's what you think about. And I don't know about you, but it can feel, can't it? Like, like the life that we were spent, supposed to live that is full and meaningful and vibrant is elusive. And we live in a day and time where we are more disconnected from the things that fill our soul than any generation of any time has ever been. 
We are entertained, but we're not enriched. We're busy, but we are not full. Our schedules are jam-packed, but our souls are on life support. And we can look at a picture like that and go, well, that, that looks about right. Especially after a week, like, as a nation, we've walked through. We, we can look at it and go, yeah, that, it, it, it feels like, it feels like we're running on empty. It's a condition that we would call weariness or a tiredness of soul. Not just body, but soul. Where we know that if we cut things out of our schedule, it doesn't solve the problem. We go on vacation, it's still there. And Jesus has words for us. He has words for, for weary people. How many are glad that Jesus has a word for weary people? I am. I am. And that's the letter that he writes to the church at Philadelphia. If you have your Bible, will you open with me to Revelation chapter 3, and we're going to start in verse 7. We've walked through five other letters. We have one remaining next week, and the letter to Philadelphia is letter number 6. And here's where, the way that Jesus starts it. He says, to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, write. Okay, we're going to stop there. Because as has been the case, if you've been with us over the last few weeks, you know that what Jesus says, the way that he addresses each city or each church in his letters is meaningful based on their history, based on their culture, based on their economy. Jesus cares about it all. And all of it matters. So let me tell you a little bit about Philadelphia. Philadelphia is roughly 80 miles inland, and it is um, the home of the Eagles who won the Super Bowl, okay? Just, just Coincidence? I think so. Okay, um, here we go. So it's uh, roughly 26 miles um, southeast of Sardis, and it didn't have a port, obviously, and so commercial trade wasn't a huge deal for Philadelphia. It was the newest of the seven cities that Jesus writes to. It was planted intentionally by a, a prominent pilgrim, a ruler from Pergamum, who moved to this area, planted the city of Philadelphia so that it would be a missionary city. And their goal was to spread the Greek culture, was to spread the Greek way, Hellenism, to, to take over this area and this region. And so when this city is planted, it did such a good job, right, surrounding it was Mycenae, Lydia, and Phrygia. It did such a good job of spreading the Greek way that Lydia ditched their language and started speaking Greek. It was considered to be a little Athens. So it had a number of different temples around. It had paganism that was rampant in this city. And so that's what the followers of Jesus were up against. The most defining characteristic about Philadelphia, though, was that in 17 AD, they had lived through or suffered one of the worst earthquakes in this region that they had ever seen. It was so bad that the people who were living in the city of Philadelphia moved out of the city and into the countryside. Listen to what one Roman historian writes. He says this about Philadelphia. The actual town has few inhabitants, for the majority live in the countryside. One is surprised, even at the few, that they are so fond of the place when they have such insecure dwellings. Everything was falling apart to the extent that people were like, we should camp. We should backpack. Let's not live here because, well, we might die. And they did. They moved to the countryside. Being a follower of Jesus in Philadelphia would have had another dynamic with it also, that the Jewish population in Philadelphia really felt like if you were a follower of Jesus, that was all fine and good, but first you needed to become a Jew. They were called Judaizers. And you needed to have, if you were a man, you needed to have a little minor surgery called circumcision. We won't put up any diagrams or go into that, but they required that. You needed to go through the ritual cleanings and washings, and you needed to follow Torah, and, and, and you could follow Jesus. And the followers of Christ said, listen, we're, we're all about Jesus, and, and so they were kicked out of the synagogue. And that was the condition that Jesus finds this church in, and 
he starts writing to them and listen to what he says. He says in verse 7, these are the words of him who is holy and true. Now, you, you could read that like genuine. To his core, he is who he is. Who holds the keys of David, the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. I know your deeds. See, I've placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you, say it with me, church, have little strength, yet you've kept my word and have not denied my name. Literally in the Greek, it's I know that you have no dynamin. Will you say it with me? Dynamin. It's where we get our English word? Dynamite. It means power. It means strength. It means like you've got wind in your sails to continue to live another day and go to work and love your spouse and do all the things that you need to do. Jesus is going, I know. I know that you are barely hanging on. Now, if you were with us last week, you, you studied with us the letter to the church at Sardis. And that letter was really interesting because in it, Jesus comes at them with this tone. Wake up, you guys. You're asleep. Like, people think you're alive, but you're dead. Strengthen what remains. He's like, come on. Like, poking them along. And the letter to Philadelphia is almost so starkly different that we could assume they were placed right next to each other to draw out a contrast. There's no condemnation in the letter to Philadelphia. No, come on, you guys. Get with it. It's all promises. It's all Jesus saying, here's what I'm going to do. Here's what I've done. Here's who I am. Weary people, people with little strength, powerless Listen to what I say. And here's what he said. I've placed before you an open door no one can shut. Those who are against you, I will make them acknowledge that I have loved you. I will keep you. I'm coming soon. I will make a, you a pillar in the temple of my God. I will write on you, on them, the name of my God. I will also write on them my new name. I will, I will, I will. I have, I have, I have. I know. Okay, so here's my question. Is the church in Philadelphia perfect? Not a trick question. What do you think? No. Here's how we know that. They're humans. <laughs> okay? They're human beings. They are imperfect. And yet, and yet, there's no place in this letter that Jesus says, come on, step it up. You're doing this wrong. And I started to ask myself, why is that? Why not? Because he could have said that to them, and it would have been true. So why not say it? And here's what I, I, I just sensed as I studied this letter more and more, and I studied these seven letters in Revelation. You just get this sense as you study them that Jesus meets people exactly where they are, not where they should be. That Jesus doesn't just say true things to people. He says true things that are helpful for them. He says true things that they can receive. Let me step back for a moment and just say, as followers of Jesus, I think that maybe from the outside looking in, people have the perspective of us where we just say things that are true. We say it because it's true without ever thinking about is it helpful? See, now, we have a word for this. When we say something that's both true and helpful, it's called wisdom. It's called wisdom. Anybody can say true things. It takes wisdom to say something that's true and helpful, which is why Jesus comes to weary followers of his way and says, I will, I will, I will, I have, I have, I have, I am, I am, I am, not what are you guys doing? Because he knows that's not what they need. And here's what he says to them. Here's what he says to them. I have, I have, I will, I will. 
And he makes promise after promise after promise after promise because he wants to point out when you have little power, you still possess great promise. When you have little power, you still possess great promises. And so I've thought about that in the week that we've had and the lament that we've offered even in this service. So God, what does it look like to have little strength but great access to you? What does it look like to have little power but great promise? How do we live in this tension of, of both hope and hurt, of both, God, you're up to something, and yet there's a reality that my feet are firmly planted in, and I refuse to ignore that the world is broken and not as it should be. What's God's word to the weary? Is it try a little harder? Do a little more. You're, you're weary because you're not trusting enough. You, you can hear that some places. And there are times maybe when that's true, but the majority of the time, it's that the pain and sorrow of life is just getting real. And so to this church, Jesus doesn't say, you're not doing enough. Step it up. Get with it. He goes, I will. I have. And I See, I think David knew this and all the things that David went through. Uh, on the run, hiding, he finally, he comes back to this place and he says this. My soul in Psalm 119, 28, my soul is weary with sorrow. So strengthen me according to your word. God, tell me something. Tell me something. Like, tell me you're up to something. Remind me that you're, you're in this. God, tell me something that's true. Don't tell me some like cliche, like, well, everything happens for a reason, which isn't true. God, tell me something that's, that's true, like you're in this with me, like you, like you love me, like you're, like you're good. It's the stuff that Jesus shares with this church in Revelation because they're, they're weary, and he's got a word for the weary. Let me show you what it is. Let me show you what it is. Uh, Revelation chapter 3. We're jumping back up to the beginning because we skipped over a portion of this that's really, really important, and here's what it is. These are the words of him who's holy and true, who holds the key of, of whom? Of David, right? What Jesus is doing through the Apostle John is he's referencing an Old Testament prophetic verse, Isaiah chapter 22, verse 22. If you have your notes out, you're following along, I would encourage you, write it down, and maybe at some point this week, go read it. Because it's in that passage that God promises, Yahweh promises his people that a man of integrity would replace a corrupt government. And that this person would be in charge of the city, they'd be in charge of the temple, they would be in charge of making sure the court system, that justice was executed. Now, this idea started to gain steam over the centuries and centuries, and people who read Isaiah looked at Isaiah and went, well, that's talking about Messiah. That's talking about, about when the, the Savior, Redeemer comes. And Jesus goes, you, you got it. You got it. I am he. I have those keys. Verse 8, what he opens, no one can shut. And what he shuts, no one can open. I know your deeds, he says, and see, I've placed before you an open door, and no one can shut it. Now, remember that Philadelphia was planted intentionally as a missionary city to spread the Greek way and the Greek culture all throughout the region, and it was successful at that. But what Jesus is saying is what was originally intended to spread Greek culture is going to be used to spread gospel culture, that what they planted in order to spread the Greek way and all sorts of um, polytheistic ideas and rampant sexuality and temple prostitution and all those things, God is going to redeem that and he's going to use this strategically planted city as an open door for his redemptive goodness, wholeness, and love for his creation. Here's the way we see it in Acts chapter 27, the same phrase. It's littered throughout the New Testament. On arriving there, this is Paul, they gathered, he gathered the church together and reported all that God had done through them and how he had what? Opened a door. Opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. 
Hey, here's what Jesus is saying to this weary church. There's a promise. The promise is that even though they have little strength, they have great access. They have access to opportunity in the midst of adversity. That even though they're short on strength, they are strong in spirit. So, friends, we lean in for just a moment. We typically look at our surroundings, we look at our circumstances, we look at our resources, and we decide what God might want to do with our life. So, God, I have this, and I have this, and I'm here, therefore, boom, you might want to do that. You do know that that's not the way God works, right? He'll often ask you, what do you have in your hand, and where are you standing? But sometimes when he asks you what you have in your hand, it's so that you can throw this stick down, and it becomes a snake, right? Right? This is Exodus chapter 3, okay? Yeah. It's, it's Paul in prison in 62 AD on house arrest, and here's his prayer. His prayer is that one of opportunity in the midst of adversity. He says, pray for me also. Pray for me. I, I'm, I'm on house arrest in Rome, but, but will you pray for me? Will you pray that I get out? That's not what he says. Pray for me. That whenever I speak, words may be given to me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel. For which I'm an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. Here's what I think Paul recognizes. That even though this door is closed, the door that leads to my freedom, there's a number of doors that are not closed. There's people coming in every single day. They're bringing me my food. They're caring for my needs. And they are a captive audience. I think there's a lot of times in life, you guys, if I could just speak really honestly about my life and and what probably happens in yours, is that we get a few doors shut. That job didn't work out. That relationship didn't work out health thing didn't work out. We get a few doors shut, and our assumption is that every door is shut. What's fascinating to me is that Jesus does not come to this church and say, I have opened all the doors. He doesn't. Read it. It's very specific. He says, I have opened a door. And so when all the doors are shut in your face, or you feel like they are, will you just know that there's at least one that's opened by his grace? There's at least one. And so we can get so discouraged. Man, we have a litany of things in our past that didn't work out the way that we wanted them to, right? And it can take the wind out of our sails or the air out of our proverbial balloon. And disappointment, here's what disappointment is. Here's the picture of disappointment. Disappointment is driving forward but constantly looking in the rearview mirror. God, I wish you would have, but you didn't, and I don't know why. And what that does is it causes us to miss the fact that, man, even though things aren't exactly the way that I would design them, there's still an opportunity there. Even though, even though the marriage is on the rocks, there's still an opportunity there. Even though things didn't work out the way that you wanted them to, in whatever situation you carry in this room, and it's, you're welcome to carry those things in, please do. There's an opportunity that's welcomed, that's still there. And what Jesus does, he doesn't just leave it there. He doesn't just say, so look for the open doors. He tells this church how they continue to walk through these doors. Look at what he says. In the right after you have little strength, he says this. Yet, yet you have not, yet you have kept my word and you have not denied my name. Here's what Jesus is saying. This church, this church at Philadelphia recognizes that disappointment is not an excuse for disobedience. Because God doesn't come through in the way that we think he should. It doesn't give us the opportunity to say, well, God, you know, I trusted you for this, and I thought you were going to do this, and this is how you're asking me to live, and I don't want to live that way anymore. And since you didn't come through on your end of the bargain, I'm not coming through on mine. Please don't tell me I'm the only one that's thrown that childish temper tantrum to God. (laughs) Right? Like, 
If my spouse doesn't treat me the way that I think they should, then I'm not going to treat them the way that God tells me to treat them. Not that Kelly's ever done that to me. She very rarely has. But <laughs> last, last service, I didn't say that. So I'm just kidding. <laughs> she wasn't here. <laughs> but don't we play that game? God, you didn't come through, therefore I'm not going to. Cold war, God. And God's like, no, 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 no. Because here's what happens. Here's what happens. When you say, I'm disappointed, therefore I'll be disobedient, you miss the opportunity that God wants to bring into your life in the midst of the adversity. So Jesus says to this church, oh man, stay with it, you guys, because I'm coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one takes your crown. If you're thinking about tapping out, because you've lost someone you love and it's God's fault or you blame God, don't, don't, don't tap out. Stay with it. If you're thinking about saying, I'm done with this because of progress isn't being made in the midst of the pain that you want to see, stick with it. Man. Yet, you've kept my word. Hey, here's the way that Jesus goes on. Verse 9. Verses 9 and 10, he says, I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan, these are the Judaizers, these are people who have kicked the followers of Christ out of the synagogue, now they're exposed to persecution in the Roman Empire. They were under the covering of the Jews before, but, but they're no longer there. He says, they claim to be Jews, but they're not, but they're liars. I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. Since you've kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that's going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. What's fascinating is that tribulation did come. It came hard and it came strong through the Roman Empire. And Philadelphia was one of the churches that continued to stand. It continued to stand, not just through that persecution that Jesus is referring to, but persecution from the Ottoman Empire, persecution from the Crusaders as they came through. This church was so resilient. And Jesus told them they would be. Hold on, you guys. But he makes this statement. I will make people acknowledge that I have what? Did you catch it? Loved you. Loved you. Here's what Jesus is saying, that we have access, one of the promises that holds us is that we have access to affection in the midst of affliction. So think about this. The word to the weary up to this point is two things. One, there's still opportunity, which answers the question when we're walking through the valley of the shadow of death, God, are you up to anything in this? And he goes, oh yeah. The second statement Jesus makes, I will make them acknowledge that I've loved you, is the second question we often ask God when we're walking through the valley, isn't it? God, do you what? Do you love me? And what Jesus wants to reaffirm to this church is, oh man, I loved you, and I have loved you, and I will love you, and I will not let you and I think there's this illusion, not so subtle, to Genesis chapter 37, that when Jacob has this dream, or Joseph has this dream, that all of his brothers are going to bow down and worship him. So he has this dream one night, and he comes in, and he tells his brothers the next morning, hey guys, good news, you're all going to worship me someday. And they're like, good news, you're on a train to Egypt, right? Like, they sell him into slavery, and there's all these things that happen in Joseph's life, and he goes through jail, and all these things, and eventually what happens is there's a famine in the world that Joseph, because of a dream he gets from God, sees coming, tells the Egyptians to hold their food and store it up so they'd have enough to sustain them. His brothers need food. They come to him, and they do what? They bow. They bow because... They see the goodness of God that's stamped on his life. They bow because there's something because of the way that he's followed Yahweh that has created a storehouse from which people draw from. And I think Jesus is painting the same picture. They're going to they're gonna see that, that my fingerprints are, are all over you. They're going to see that, 
that I've blessed you. As John would say in 1 John, that, that when he is revealed, we will be revealed with him. People will go, oh, I didn't see Paulson like that when he was here. So there's this both and, this like end eschatological picture Jesus is painting, but also a very everyday picture. And he gives them this promise in verse 12 that's fascinating in light of their history. The one who's victorious, the one who, the one who continues to walk. I will make a what? Pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. Now, what Jesus is doing is making a not so subtle to the first century reader reference to the fact that when the earthquakes hit, everybody did what in the city? They left it because it was insecure, because it was falling down around them. Years and years and years later, the only thing standing in Philadelphia was these two pillars that held up the Byzantine church that was there. Awesome. <laughs> Whatever. You... <laughs> hey, yeah, yeah. That's awesome! <laughs> Here's what Jesus is saying. The, the love that I've placed on you, the affection that I've covered you with, will sustain you, will hold you, will carry you, will keep you, even when it feels like all the world is crumbling down around you. So for weary people this morning, can I just tell you he's for you, that he loves you, that he's good, that he has not let you go, that the book of Romans chapter 8 verses 37 through 39 would say that neither death nor life nor angels, principalities or anything present or anything to come can separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing. Amen. He's going, you're going to stand in that for all time. And here's how he ends it. He says this, the one who's victorious, I will make a pillar the temple of my God, never again will they have to leave it. You're not going to be on shaky ground anymore. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I will write on them my new name. So if our, our questions are, God, where are you in the midst of this? And he goes, oh, there's still an open door. And if our question is, God, do you, still, do you still love me even when it feels like everything in life is just exhausted and exhausting and painful and sorrowful? If our questions then are, God, is this ever going to change? His answer to the first is, oh, there's opportunity. His answer to the second is, there's affection. And his answer to the third is that in this promise that in the midst of despair, there is a hope of destiny. Or as we said in the notes, access to destiny in the midst of despair. And he says it in two ways. He says, one, that you will have written on you the name of your God. In the prosperity gospel stream, there's this idea of name it and claim it. You see it, you want it, you tell God, it's done. Well, what God's saying to you is, I have named you and I have claimed you and you are mine, and my name is on you to signify it, to make you remember it, to, for all time that you would be carrying my name. What's fascinating, what's fascinating is that the city of Philadelphia, before Jesus writ, wrote this letter, had gone through two different name changes. They were, by Tiberius, they were restored after um, an earthquake. They were restored by Tiberius, and so they called the city Neo Caesarea, Neo Caesarea. The, the new Caesar city. A number of years later, they were restored by Vespasian, and so they named the city Flavius after that. Can you imagine the branding nightmares for this city? Like, I just got the Flavius tattoo, and now we're back to Philadelphia. Okay, whatever, whatever. And so when Jesus tells them this, they know what that looks like. They know what that means. And he's going, that, that, my name's never going to change. 
My name's on you. Will you look up at me for just a moment? We're gonna, we're, we'll land the plane here in a second. We all have a choice between two approaches in life. We can either work at earning a name, or we can posture ourselves to receive a name. But it's only those two choices. And sometimes we're named by our accomplishments, and sometimes we're named by our failures, and sometimes we're named by our relationships. Uh, somebody might call you son or daughter or dad or grandpa or uncle or aunt or whatever. But most of the time, we are writing one achievement to the next in order to say, this is who I am. And what Jesus wants to do is he wants to speak into that fog and say, no, 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 your destiny is as mine, as my children, as carrying my name. But this you know, for the prophet Isaiah says, this is what the Lord says, he who created you, O Jacob, who formed you, O Israel, do not fear, for I've redeemed you. I have summoned you by name, and what? You are mine. You are mine. But the second thing he says, because that's part of our destiny, but it's not the whole picture. The second thing he says is, oh yeah, oh yeah, let's not forget. I'll write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem. So here's what you need to do. You need to flip over a few chapters in Revelation in order to get a picture of what Jesus is talking about. Because this is way too good to just point you to it until you read it at some point if you ever get a chance, because this is a picture of our destiny. So our question, as we started and we entered into lament, is, is God, where are you in this? And God, what are you doing? And sometimes the answer to that can be slippery, but here's, here's, here's what followers of Jesus, here's how they answer the problem of evil and suffering and pain in our world. That God does not ignore that, that God does not stand at a distance but he enters in, that he entered in to the depth that he took the most vile expression of that evil and of that violence and of that heartache and of that pain, and that he took it on the cross, and he took it into the grave and into the depths of hell, and that he buried sin and he buried death and he buried evil, and he walked out the other side with the hope of glory. It says, and then I saw, Revelation 21, a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people. And he will dwell with them. They will be his people. And God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eye. There will be no more death, no more mourning, no more crying, no more pain. For the old order of things has passed away. And he who is seated on the throne said, I am making everything, what? No. Then, write, then he said, write this down. For these words, that I'm making everything new, that one day there will be no more sorrow, no more crying, no more pain, write this down because it's trustworthy and it's true. Here's what Jesus is saying. There is a time limit on your disappointment. There's a time limit on your weariness that even now God is working and weaving and making all things new. There's a time limit on wondering, God, where are you? Because the day is coming when resurrection will be a reality and the new creation that Jesus began when he walked out of the grave will be complete. Now we stand with our feet in two worlds, one of reality and one of hope. And one day, those will come together. So what does this mean for us as a church? Here's what I think it means. It means that we're going to be a harbor for weary people. Listen, if Jesus cares about the weariness of soul that people carry, we should too, right? 
There's this passage, Isaiah chapter 50, verse 4. I pray it before I preach every single week. God, give me a word for the weary. And so if you're weary, you're welcome. You're welcome here. If you don't have it all together, you don't have to pretend like you do. Because sometimes the reality is life feels, whoops, like that. (laughs) And we don't have to pretend like it doesn't. So we're not going to beat people down with religion. you got to do this. you got to do that. We're going to introduce people to Jesus. Because we believe that when we see him, we're changed. We're going to provide opportunity and point it out. We're going to affirm God's affection for people. And we're going to point people to that day that Jesus referred to. So you might be asking, what do I do with that this week? How does, that, how does that impact my week? What, what can I do to drive that deeper into my soul? Great question. Here's two things you could do. What if this week, what if this week you, you asked someone how they were doing and then you really listened to what they told you? And when they said things are going good and you just had the sense that maybe they weren't, you pushed a little bit further and just said, hey, you know what? If it's not going okay, I'd love to talk to you about it. And I'm here for you. That, that's birthed out of the training that we had yesterday, um, People Welcoming People Workshop. If you missed that, I'm sorry for you. It was amazing. We'll try to do it again. It, it was awesome. But really listen. And then what if this week you memorized Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30? where Jesus says this to his followers. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. He goes, hey, I want you to learn how to carry the burdens of life. They're not gonna go away, but you can carry them a little bit different. For I'm gentle and I'm humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. We're going to close our time with a prayer and a song. But there's two words that I have on my heart for this year for us as a body. One is attentive, that I want us to be attentive to what God's doing in our midst, and the second is responsive. And so what I'd like you to do as you pick up your stuff, well, you, clo- well, you can close your Bibles, put them away, and you can stand up. We're going to, we're going to spend some time singing just one last song. What I want you to do is just ask yourself the question. You can close your eyes. This is just between you and God. Is your soul weary? You can stand up. Is your soul weary? You exhausted? Schedule is full, but your soul is parched. You're entertained, but maybe you're, you're not enriched that you're busy, but you're not full. If that's you, if you're just here today and you're sort of running on empty, I just want to pray for you and then we're going to sing a song. So will you just raise your hand? Just say, yeah, that's me. That's me. Awesome. That's me. That's you. So Father, with all these hands raised, that I pray that your spirit would minister, that you'd strengthen, that you'd raise up, that you'd remind us of the opportunities that are still in front of us in the midst of adversity, that the affection that's for us in the midst of affliction and the destiny that you have purchased, even as we walk through despair, would we be people who set our mind and our hope there. I pray over my friends who are weary today. Would you, by the power of your spirit, would you strengthen us in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Let's sing this last song as a prayer. As always, if you'd like to come forward and kneel and pray, you can. You can do that.